And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, as we continue working our way through this sermon letter written by an anonymous author to a people with a Jewish background of faith who because of trouble, hardship, and persecution are finding themselves considering abandoning their faith in Jesus. And the author of Hebrews is writing very strategically, reaching back into church history and taking people and episodes of faith and showing that God's people have always had the requirement of needing to persevere through suffering in saving faith. So we've looked through Hebrews 11, which is filled with positive examples of individuals who persevered through hardship. Prior to Hebrews chapter 11, you may recall, he gave some negative examples of Israelites who did not persevere in the faith. But this morning we come to another one of those positive examples. It's, it's the person of Moses. It's the life of Moses. And so in these few minutes that I have with you, I get to share 120 years of Moses' life. And we'll try to do it in three small points that capture what the author emphasized out of Moses' life, while also getting some larger context that would be helpful to us. So give your attention to the reading. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. And by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. A lot of history, a lot of horrific events in what we're going to consider this morning. Let's pray that God would help us rightly understand His Word. Lord, this morning, would you remind us of things maybe we already know? Or would you teach us things we've never heard? Lord, would you impress upon all of us the good news that is ours by faith in Christ Jesus? We pray this for one another in Jesus' name. Amen. So you may have heard it said before, particularly with a passage like Hebrews 11, where you have all these episodes and historical events and these real people, these historic characters, that there is a thread that ties them all together. I had a professor in seminary who used to talk about it like a, like a string of pearls. So you have all these individual beautiful episodes and, and stories and events but the thread that holds all those many pearls together is the thread of God's covenant promise. 
He is unfolding this story. He is the author of history. He is doing something. So maybe it's helpful for you to think of all these people, events, and characters as a string of pearls and that God's redeeming covenant promise is the string that runs them through. Or another one of my professors who spoke of it as a golden cable, that a three-stranded golden cable runs from Genesis to Revelation. And that the three-stranded cable is God's kingdom, God's covenant, and God's mediator. The promise of a Messiah to come. All of that, I think, is good. It's helpful. It's appropriate. And as we seek to get our arms around Holy Scripture and the 66 books and all the people in the history, that helps us understand that truth that God is at work. And I know I say that a lot and I say it all the time, but it's... It's because it's what the scriptures tell us. He is at work doing something in his world. And he is doing that even now. He's doing it still in us and through us. So three simple points this morning. And the first is this. That promise, that covenant promise continues to unfold in Hebrews 11 and in church history. And it unfolds by faith. That promise first made in Genesis chapter 3, 15, that God would send a redeemer, a head crusher. All of these people, all of these stories, all of these events, they're pearls with that thread of God's covenant promise coming true. And the story is unfolding dramatically and beautifully. And you and I are to hear it as history and to be encouraged by it. That promise we've seen in previous weeks was of an abundant seed that God's people, that His church would multiply and fill the earth. It was a promise that they would be a blessing, that they would bless the peoples, the nations, because God would use them and make them great. And it was the promise of a Redeemer that eventually that head crusher would come. And all that is at play here as this story of Moses unfolds and plays out. There's this covenantal refrain in this story and every story that sounds like this. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, so do not fear. I am the Lord. And that is that constant echo and refrain, story after story in the Bible, as God proves Himself to His people. And you know what a refrain is. I thought this morning, okay, what's the first refrain that comes to my mind? Something musically that repeats itself over and over and over again. And though I've not heard the song in years, the refrain that came to my mind was, we built this city. We built this city. We built this city on rock and roll. What an absurd refrain. But that's what came to my mind is what's a refrain? Well, we built the city on rock and roll. Yahweh has said his refrain that he keeps reminding his people is, I will be your God. You will be my people. I will use you. I will bless you. I will make you great. Now, I do it on my timetable, but you see that I prove faithful to my promises. That is the refrain, and it is seen throughout the life of Moses, which is our second point. That is the faith of Moses' parents. Now, quick little exam question. How many of us could pass a, a one question test this morning if the question was, what are the names of Moses' parents? I bet a few of you could pass that. I bet if you asked me on Tuesday, I couldn't have answered it. We're not given their names. Not in Hebrews 11. Not in Exodus 1 and 2. And not in Acts 7, where they are spoken. We're not given their personal names. But we are shown that they are intricately involved and important in the redemptive story. And there's great hope for us in there. Amram and Jacobet. Those are their names. Aren't they pretty? Amram and Jacobet. 
Now, to understand the context of what we're going to hear and see in the life of Moses, you heard uh, the author of Hebrews reference it very briefly. And I was tempted to read from Exodus 1 and 2, but that was a very lengthy reading. So instead, here's what we're going to do. We have to capture what is a horrific context of these events. But let's do it in Acts chapter 7 with a speech that we're given from Stephen just before he stoned to death. So recounting this story and others led to Stephen stoning. Let's hope this works out better for me on our 30th anniversary as a church. Acts chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 17 to 22. This is recounting Moses' history. As the time drew near for God to fulfill His promise to Abraham, there's your thread, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. At that time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. And when he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and in action. All right, you heard it there, a wonderful little quick summary of the long detail of Exodus 1 and 2. But Joseph, now catch these covenant themes that come together. Joseph, who had been a great blessing to Egypt, just as the Lord said his people would be, right? Remember, I'll make my people increase in number and they'll be a blessing. And that was Joseph. Joseph was the one who his gifts were used by God to help during times of famine. And he was a blessing to the people. But that Pharaoh, that king, passed. And the new Pharaoh and king down through the course of time had no idea who Joseph was and what benefit he had been. But what he did notice is the Israelites have increased in number and they are a threat to Pharaoh the king. And so in an effort to build his own empire against God's kingdom, he says, we'll extinguish these little boys. We'll do away with these little Hebrew children. And there in Exodus, you'll read the story of how the Hebrew midwives cleverly protected the life of these little Hebrew children. And they protected those children that were born and did not let their lives be extinguished, which led to the anger of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And he said, well, then it will be an edict. It will be a rule, a command that every Hebrew boy child will be thrown into the Nile River. He'll be drowned. And you think about it, that's part of the horrific nature of the story. We've seen it maybe in cartoon movies, maybe in Sunday school books. Picture it for real. It's horrific. It's horrible. It's not unlike what would happen later with King Herod in the New Testament, as Satan would again seek to extinguish the male children of Israel. All of these efforts being his attempt to stop the head crusher from coming. Another sermon there for another day from Matthew 13. But we have these parents who are unnamed in Hebrews 11. They're unnamed by Stephen in Acts chapter 7. They're unnamed in Exodus chapter 2. But what the author of Hebrews does, it's important to note, is he highlights first not the faith of Moses, the faith of his parents. And that's significant. He says, by faith, Moses' parents, who go unnamed, they did these things. By faith, they hid the not ordinary child for three months. Now, depending on the translation you have in front of you, 
it may say that they hid the beautiful child. So what's going on here? This sounds a little bit peculiar to us. What was not ordinary about Moses, or a better translation, what was beautiful about Moses? And is this suggesting that because Moses was a pretty baby, they didn't want him killed? Well, to save you uh, what I did this week in reading and hearing many different things, the sum of it would be this. This word here, probably uh, for us, synonymously, we would say because he was a goodly child, he was healthy, he was vital, he was distinguished, and somehow by faith, they knew that God was at work that God would protect this life, that this child had something to do with God's promise. That seems to be the best understanding of what's being said about this little one. Then it says that by faith, they were not afraid of the king. They were not afraid of the king's power. They were not afraid of the king's edict. And so it's a lesson about parenting according to God's promise by faith. And there's something good for us as a congregation and for all of us who are Christians, who aspire to be parents, who are parents, who have been parents. There's something good here to be reminded and comforted about that God is at work accomplishing His purposes. Two quotes on this. I don't have them for the wall, so listen carefully to to this. This is Sinclair Ferguson. He says, The story of Moses' faith begins with a statement of Moses' parents' faith. That is telling us something hugely significant about God's purpose, promise, and plan. His parents lived by faith in the promise of God and in the Word of God. They committed themselves to the nurture of their little boy, and they did so without fear. I think that may be the single most important thing for Christian parents in the world of today. To know that faith in God's covenant promise produces strength over fear. Trusting the Lord. He went on to say, has there ever been a scarier time to be a Christian parent of Christian children in the world? But can it get any scarier than this? than your child being taken from you and thrown into a river? It's always been scary to be associated with the God of the covenant and with His promise. There's always a force coming after us and our children and our families. And literally they saw it and the horror of it. But they're praised for their faith. Now I want to think about this for a moment. As horrific as this all is, can you imagine being the mother and concluding, I'm going to hide what would have been for 12 months, nine months of pregnancy to the point that the child was three months old. And then she comes to the decision to protect this life by not throwing the child in the Nile, but placing the child in the Nile in a basket covered with pitch. And as I thought about that this week, I thought, you know, how confident in your basket weaving do you have to be? And in your recipe for pitch, waterproof pitch, you got to be pretty confident either in your abilities or in the God of the covenant, the God of promise. And I'm sure it's some degree of both. But you mothers, better than us men, you can probably feel and sense the the horror of placing your child in that basket and wondering what's going to happen. But you're trusting the God of promise. And that's what she did. By faith, the scriptures say that she did it. And the faith of Moses' parents is praised. They saw that this child was distinguished. They remembered God's covenant promise. They placed him in this basket, which, by the way, the word for it here is ark. The word is used two times in the Bible. The first time, it's said of Noah and the ark. The second time is here. Both times, it's the same imagery. And it's what I called it last time. 
It's the little treasure chest, little in this case, big in the other, the treasure chest containing God's covenant promise. The seed line of the Messiah that would come. God, His blessing was on the ark, and His blessing is on this basket. He calls it ark both times. It's placed in the Nile, and then Pharaoh's daughter... In God's providence, remember the providence in Joseph's life? Now it's the providence in Moses' life. Pharaoh's daughter comes down to the river to bathe, she and her maidens. And she sees the basket, and she looks at the child, little peekaboo. It's a Hebrew child. Now how would she know it was a Hebrew child? Probably because of circumcision. It's been distinguished. He's been marked. Can't hide that. That could have brought the wrath down on this basket. Could have submerged the basket underwater. But God's providence, God's grace, God's favor wins the heart of this princess, Pharaoh's daughter, and she shows compassion. So it's an amazing story. And it just gets better, as you know, if you're familiar with the story. The maidens say, do you want us to go and find a nurse who can tend to this baby, who can feed this baby? And the, and the princess is like, that's exactly what I want you to do. Now go get someone. And who do they go get? There are probably a lot of options to go get. Because remember, the children have been drowned. There are going to be mothers who probably could have nursed the child. But in God's providence, God's care, His orchestrating of events... It's the mother of the baby they go and get to serve as a nurse. And it just gets better. The princess says, I'll pay you to rear this child, to feed this child, to influence this child. And as a reader of the text, you have to be, how could this all be true? If there's not this hand of providence and this thread of God fulfilling His purposes, we can't thwart His purposes. We can't change His purposes. God's will will be done. And it's beautiful and it's intended to comfort us and to remind us, do not have fear in this life. The God of promise will see His promises through. And so the mother of Moses rears that little one, feeds that little one. And we don't know for how long that happened. It was years. We don't know. It doesn't say. But there's every reason to believe that this unique little blessed, beautiful child received the shaping of his covenant-nurturing mother while also getting the best education that Egypt had to offer. And those things prepared him for how he would be used and the things that he would do in the future. All God's beautiful purpose, plan, and promise coming true. Rob Rayburn says regarding this gift of God and parents, he says, Moses got his faith the old-fashioned way from his parents. He got it from what they taught him about the Lord and his covenant with Israel and his promises of land, seed, and blessing. He got it most especially from his parents' example of faith. The very thing Moses is commended for in verse 27, that he did not fear the king, that he did not fear the king's anger, is what was first described to Moses' parents. This is how we pass on the faith to our children. By our words, and much more powerfully, by our actions. And so parents, be encouraged. God is at work. There is much to fear in this life as we rear children. And it's been said that really it's not the parents who fear so much. It's always the grandparents. Because they see the cultural change so much more than the parents do. But God is at work. God is sustaining His church. He's protecting His people. He's fulfilling His plan. That's our hope. That's our confidence. That the same God is doing the same work for the good of His people just as He always had. That covenant refrain to comfort us is, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Do not fear, for I am the Lord. By the way, that refrain that he speaks to his people in the Old Testament, you know, sometimes it comes um, 
with smoke and fire and shaking of mountains, where he in anger reminds his rebellious people, I am the Lord your God, fear me and nothing else. But sometimes it comes as a very gentle and tender voice to a hurting and confused people. But it's the same refrain either way. I am the Lord your God. Do not fear. I'm the Holy One of Israel. Do not be afraid. So I don't know where you are, if you need a thundering voice of the covenant refrain or if you need the tender voice. But it's all here, all in the pages of Scripture. God's always telling us the same story of who He is. And that leads us to the faith of Moses. And very quickly, to sum him up, there are two events, two periods of time in his life to emphasize. And the first is when he's 40 years old, and the second is when he is 80 years old. So we've already heard when he was born, zero years old. So how about something from age 40, something from age 80? Again, Acts chapter 7 will sum this up succinctly for us. Listen to verses 23 to 32. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites, that is leaving the palace of Egypt. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And when Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. Then, episode 2, after 40 years had passed, so he's 80, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. And when he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. And as he went over to get a closer look, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there's your covenantal refrain once again. Two defining moments. I'll close with these, but to consider from the life of Moses. Defining moment number one is that when Moses left the palace of the Pharaoh to go see the Israelites, and he witnessed an Israelite, a Hebrew, being mistreated by an Egyptian. He chose to be identified, the author of Hebrews says, with Israel and not with Egypt. He stuck his neck out for Israel, not for Egypt. And in doing that, he chose God's family over Pharaoh's family. And more tangibly for us, in doing that, Moses, the author of Hebrews says, denied himself the treasures of Egypt, the pleasures of Egypt. So think of that for a moment. He has all the benefits of living in the palace of Pharaoh all the riches, the access to all the treasure and all the pleasure. But the author of Hebrews says, by faith, he chose to identify with the poverty of Israel, to be mistreated, he says, as a follower of Christ, because he's giving us his understanding of what the whole Old Testament is about. And so he's praising him that this man, by faith, was willing to walk away from treasure and pleasure and willing to be scorned as a follower of Christ Jesus. And I guess that's just the obvious application for every one of us. Is it easy to walk away from treasure and pleasure? Or do you find at the end of the day that's where your heart leans and where it presses and what it wants? We're told by faith Moses was willing to walk away from it all, to identify with God's people 
rather than with Pharaoh's family. He made a hard and fast decision, and that was at age 40. Then the second episode is at age 80, where Moses led Israel to and through the Red Sea. After that burning bush incident where the Lord would say, it's time, it's time. So here's the question. For Moses from ages 40 to 80, what was he doing? Do you remember? For 40 years, he was tending sheep. And they weren't even his own sheep. They were his father-in-law's sheep. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? That's what he did. On this subject, one of the commentators I read said this. There's a real sense where Moses, at, at age 80, waiting for God's promise to come true. How many days is he concluding, is it ever going to happen? Here he is at age 80. And it's, it was said by this commentator, Moses has felt like he is in the cul-de-sac of life. Now, some of you maybe live on a cul-de-sac, an end of a road where there's nothing more. Cul-de-sac literally means bottom of the sack. You get to the bottom of the bag of chips, kids, and there's nothing left. That's the cul-de-sac. And so at age 80, there's a real sense where Moses is likely, is this as good as it gets? Is God going to see his promises through? But at age 80, God is at work. God has something to do. And he will use Moses for this redemptive event of the Old Testament that helps us understand the very redemptive event of Jesus Christ. So I offer that to you as it was encouragement to me whether you're 40 or 80 or anywhere before or in between or after, God is at work. He's always proving he is accomplishing his purpose and his plan for his people. If you think you're in a cul-de-sac of life, let me remind you. The Lord says, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Do not fear, for I am the Lord. Let's thank God that he's true to his promises and he accomplishes his purposes. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for what we've heard. And for those of us who are wrestling with fears, would you show yourself to be the God who is a faithful promise keeper? Lord, would you enable us today to celebrate the fact that you are the Lord of faithfulness who keeps all of his promises? Give us the faith to believe, Lord. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.